Welcome, everyone. My name is Robin Elander, Executive Director for Downtown Santa Barbara. Uh, we're here for another one of our downtown spotlights highlighting uh, different business owners. And this week we have some side street stars, food and drink, um, some restaurateurs. But first, I want to introduce um, our my co-host, Matt Kepman. Uh, Matt is the senior editor of the Santa Barbara um, at the Santa Barbara Independent. Um, he's worked there since 99 and covered a wide range of topics. Uh, today, he focused mostly on food and drink as well as some special projects for the paper. Um, he's a contributing editor to Wine Enthusiast Magazine where he gets to review more than 200 wines per month. So that's very exciting. Um, he also released one of his, another uh, project, his first book, The Winemakers of Santa Barbara. Uh, County. So congratulations, Matt, on that recent release and welcome uh, everybody. It's great to have you here. Matt, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Robin. I'm using my book as to prop up my uh, my computer here. Otherwise, I'd show you. Uh, <laughs> but I, uh, I, we started this, uh, Robin, at Independent and Santa Barbara Downtown started this, what was it, last late last summer, last fall? And we've done a number of these weekly series focusing on different sectors of the business community. I've been hosting a lot of the food and drink ones. Um, and today we decided to focus on people who own restaurants kind of on the side streets. You know, a lot of our attention uh, for downtown gets focused on State Street, naturally, it's the main thoroughfare. But there's a lot of exciting stuff. Uh, some could argue even the most exciting stuff is happening on the side streets. And so we're bringing in uh, some of the, you can say pioneers, at least modern pioneers of, of this trend uh, with Mitchell Servin here, who's opened Bouchon back in uh, 1998 on uh, Victoria Street. Tony Royo opened Los Arroyos on Figueroa Street back in, was it 99 or 2000, Tony? 99. 99. And then Ruben Perez, uh, his family actually, uh, well, Mitchell actually doubled down on the side street trend and opened a restaurant called Seagrass uh, on um, Ortega Street. Uh, and then Ruben Perez's family actually bought that for Mitchell. Uh, you said it was what, 2010? 2010, yeah. 2010. Um, and so his family has been really creative about how they're using that space and, um, Really, all these guys have been really dynamic when it comes to dealing with the pandemic and, and staying on top of things and making sure their employees are as employed as possible and, and, and keeping money coming through the door. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But first of all, let's start um, with a little bit of background on you guys. Um, Mitchell, um, tell us about your background as a restaurateur and um, why you decided, you know, when you decided to kind of stake your claim, you, you picked a, a side street location and, and what are the disadvantages and advantages of that? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, it's great that The Independent is hosting this. Great to be with uh, my fellow restaurateurs here. And thanks, Robin, for hosting uh, as part of the downtown organization. Of course. Uh, in fact, I, I did drop a map. I, I think that's incumbent about anyone who wants to open a restaurant to try to determine, you know, at what area within what region, even as small as a few blocks within the downtown of any area, you'd want to open a restaurant. And for me, there were two critical components. One was um, you know, a lot of people think of fine dining, uh, which we used to use and now we, we avoid uh, because it comes with all the uh, baggage of you got to make a reservation, you got to dress up, it's going to take forever. Uh, but at one point in time, we did not want to be on State Street because of the foot traffic, which sounds counterintuitive to a lot of people, but it's one of the ways we would pre-qualify our diners in the sense that we'd want them to find us uh, rather than just stumble into us. And the other part of that, of course, is very practical, and that is that typically rents on the main commercial thoroughfare like State Street are going to be substantially higher than they are on side streets. Even just a, a two block distance from State Street can drop your rent by 30 to even 50 percent. So when I first started looking for a space, uh, my first restaurant, you might recall, was on De La Vina Street back in 1996 called Meritage. Uh, I had a 50 percent partner in that. She kept it for several years after that. But after we partnered with company, I went looking for a spot and I actually drew out a map where it was just the two adjacent streets to State Street, so Anacapa uh, and Chapala, and then no further north than Sola and no further south than Gutierrez and not on State Street. And that was my original map I started with. So when I discovered this space was available, it used to be a restaurant called Oysters um, and he had kind of an overflow patio out front that he'd used during the lunchtime. And that was extremely appealing to me for a dinner house, uh, just needed some, some upgrades like any place you take over. And um, from there, we just decided uh, that was the spot for us. And did it, um, I mean, was the formula successful kind of right out of the gates? I mean, it was, it was a special place. You had to find it. You weren't just walking by. I mean, was there, was there a hurdle to attracting those customers at first or people uh, knew you not, and they wanted to? 
Not, not really. Uh, downtown was a known entity and we were an okay block then. Anyone who's lived in Santa Barbara for even a little while knows that the, the nucleus of popular spots kind of shifts up and down State Street, depending on what's going on from a retail standpoint or, or otherwise. Uh, when I did first move in, uh, I recently reviewed my letter to my landlord back in 98 that illustrated my concerns about this area. And it talked about the Granada Theater being boarded up uh, the Vaughns across the street from us being rather run down, uh, not well kept, um, et cetera. There are a lot of concerns in this little, you know, kind of block or two block area. Hey, you you got that all fixed. You, you did. did. Mitchell. Yeah. Yeah. Mitchell. Both, you, know. <laughs> so, you know, looking a lot like Nostradamus. Um, but yeah, the new Vic Theater coming in was huge. Uh, the Arlington, of course, was a, a big draw then, but a lot of their performing arts uh, like Santa Barbara Opera, the Symphony, those folks moved into the Granada Theater when it reopened. Uh, and that, that was a big game changer for us. So, you know, being on a side street, not having the foot traffic means you want to attract earlier diners, later diners, you know, multiple turns uh, of long time rather than just doing a bunch of volume. And that was instrumental in our success, maybe five to seven years after reopening. When those things all kind of fell into place, that's when things took off for us at Bouchon. And who were your neighbors when you opened? Were there other restaurants right next to you or not really? Uh, the Not really. Uh, Olio Limone was uh, Video Schmidio for all of you VHS people. And, uh, you know, like I said, the Santa Barbara Public Market, which is a great facility to have here downtown now, was a Vons. Um, so, yeah, you know, in 20 years, you'd expect to see a lot of change in this neighborhood. But it's fortunately done nothing but improve. You had that uh, kind of interesting herbal guy next door for a while, too. No, oh, yeah, Coco. Yeah. I, and I often think of Ruben when I think of him because, you know, a couple of my friends who I was business partners with for a brief moment um, in the early 2000s, we opened a private restaurant called Mondial across from the Jiffy Lube. There's a good landmark. Wow. to tell people I want them to go dining. We're next to the Jiffy Lube. Uh, they wanted a small tapas place. And, and the biggest challenge they ran into was, you know, in a big urban uh, environment, you have people coming in at four or five o'clock for a quick bite. You've got people coming at nine, 10 o'clock at night, you know, grab a, a plate and a beer. Uh, but in Santa Barbara, we're a, a one trick pony for the most part. It's a dinner hour town. And so my friends at Mondial, Cynthia Miranda and Scott Schoenzeit, you know, were world renowned in our little world of Santa Barbara for having these great plates of food. I'm sure you remember, Matt. Uh, yeah. But their issue, and everybody went, well, this is fantastic cheap dinner. And so they were packed at seven and nobody at five and nobody at nine. And I think that's a real challenge for people who are trying to be affordable in Santa Barbara and offer alternatives to, you know, a sit down dining experience like Bouchon in that they end up, you know, with not enough volume, really. Right. I love Mondial. They end up doing our wedding, actually. So uh, it led to something. <laughs> and you're, you're still together. So, you know, oh, there's that. still together. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, all right, Tony, tell us about uh, your path to uh, becoming a restaurateur and uh, why you decided to open on Figaro Street when you did. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Robin, for having me today. Um, well, my past is I came to Santa Barbara in 1984 and been working in restaurants since then, especially in town. Um, I work always two jobs. I always had two restaurant jobs. I started as a cleaning windows, going through all the way to be a cook, a chef becoming assistant manager, general manager. So I've been on the whole restaurant business at all, basically. Um, we opened Los Arroyos in 1999. Um, I had a dream and I always want to do my own restaurant. Um, we, I start talking with my former wife, Maria, and say, this is my dream. I, I wish I can do that. And, and she support me. And we both start looking for the location and she actually find the location in a small little ad on the paper. And when we went and look at that location, which is on Figueroa, it used to be 18 West Figueroa, um, people were said, nobody makes it in that location. You know, there is restaurants that goes in, goes out, goes in, goes out. And so, you know, it was a little negative uh, situation right away, but um, my dream was there. And I did kind of like Mitchell did, I went around Look, what's my competition? What kind of clientele do I have? You know, what's the average time that they have to eat? And we came up with a recipe from Los Royos, which is kind of like an order at the register, take out quickly, 
and and that worked for us right away. Yeah, I mean, I started working at the Independent back in uh, 1999, and it was like it was the place we went for lunch. I want to say almost daily for a while. You know, yeah, almost too much. Um, you know, was, Tony, you know, I looked at your space before I opened Bouchon. You did? How oh, nice! I did. Oh yeah, I love that spot. That was that was, that was Picasso. Or? Yeah, Picasso. Gotcha. That was a hot yeah. spot back in my college days at UCSB to take the girls. You left her just right for me. Perfect. Good. It was work. too small. That was my takeaway. Too small. And That's when true. did you expand into the bigger space? Well, and we we stay in that location with sublease from somebody. It wasn't like we got the lease. We only had three year sublease and the time was coming. And you know, this is a very funny story and people shouldn't know that. Uh, my lease was coming up and this guy, I got the option either to purchase it or to leave the location. And he wants so much money. And I mean, he was already ripping me up with the rent. And, and so one day I used to live in Luneta Plaza and we saw this old lady getting out of her car with baggages. And, and so we, we went and helped it. And she asked me, what are you doing? And where do you leave? So I said, I live in Luneta Plaza, make it short and simple. You know, I told her that I own a restaurant in downtown Figueroa. And she looked at me, she says, what's the name of the restaurant? I said, Los Arroyos. And she's like, oh, my name is Barbara Shawty. I own that location. Oh, and I, wow. God. And so that's how I know that my landlord was my, my neighbor. And I didn't even know that. And so she knows the situation was going on with my sub lister. And, and she says, you know what? We want you there. So don't buy him out let him close, we'll give it to you. And it was so impressive how everything came and the timing was perfect. We still give some money to the guy um, and, and it was fine. But once we start taking over uh, Los Royals, it start getting busy and very, you know, we didn't have enough room, like you said. I, I actually ran behind the building. I don't know if you still remember, it was a parking lot, a little parking space owned by Ron Gilio. And so he rented to me for several months. And you know, that little back door that you used to have there with the big metal, people go through there, see that on the patio. We call it a patio. I just went to Costco and buy some tents and you know, put tables and chairs and we got another 20 seats on the back. And so that's how we start growing and growing and growing. And again, timing is perfect. Next door to us was a nail salon and she was ready to close the business. And so we took over the nail salon and half of that location, we did a dining area and the other half, we got a bathroom for the employees and storage because there was no storage in there. And so <clears throat> restaurants started growing. And of course, Mrs. Weinstein was there, the toughy place. And she just sold her business for somebody. And before she gave her, her notice, she says, I'm moving out. I sold my business. You're the first person that I'm gonna told you, do you wanna take over? I already got a hood on the back, you know, already got established for a restaurant and, and man, again, timing was perfect. So we took over Mrs. Weinstein and thanks to her, you know, we got the bigger location that we have now. Uh, and Tony, real quick, I mean, you've had uh, great success in expanding your model. So how many locations do you have now? We you now only have four locations. I got to the point that I have six. Uh, right now, we got three in Santa Barbara. I have one more in Indiana, and I'm also inside the Pacers Stadium. You know, we got two locations inside there, So, but that's a small location. But right now, we got four. Right, right. I mean, before we move to Ruben, there was one question I think it's relevant to ask both Mitchell and, and Tony from one of our watchers from um, Michelle <clears throat> was um, because things, have, by the time Ruben opened his place, the media world had changed a little bit. Um, but for both of you guys, what was your biggest hero when it came to getting noticed initially? Was it restaurant reviews? Was it word of mouth? Or was it advertising? I don't know, Mitchell, you want to go first? Yeah, doing sufficient volume was always the, the issue for us. Um, you know, and I, I figure we'll get to this at one point where we're talking about the impacts of pandemic and, you know, regardless of being a side street restaurant, you know, being a full service restaurant means you carry a, a hefty payroll. You know, we do two and a half million dollars a year in, in business and, and we have a payroll of about $80,000 a month. So, you know, getting started out with those numbers is the biggest challenge by far. You know, people ask me if you could do it over again, would you change the model? You know, all this talk of pivoting to other models uh, really 
eliminates front of house staff for all practical purposes. Yeah. I mean, a couple of cashiers perhaps or a food runner, but you know, that, that was the biggest fear by far in the beginning. Um, but getting started, like all three of us on, on here, um, you know, you work a lot, you're willing to do it because you love what you do. And so as opposed to someone who bought a restaurant or opened a restaurant and hired a bunch of people to run it for them, you know, all three of us, you know, have started like Tony did, you know, dishwasher for me all the way on up and then said, we love this business and we want to be in it. And I think that's probably more critical to our success than anything else. Uh, back in 98, there wasn't internet as we know it. So it was is S. Irene Verbilla from the LA Times going to come and review or Bon Appetit magazine or whatever. And we've got a few of those and those were very important, uh, but really word of mouth, as they say, was just as critical then as it is now. Uh, it's just not as much yelping about it. Right. Same for you, Tony. Was it word of mouth that really brought people in initially? It did. The word of mouth was my best. I have, you know, when I opened Los Arroyos, I really ran out of my savings, you know, fill it up all my credit cards and I had nothing else to do advertisement. At that time, yes, it was Santa Barbara News Press and stuff like that, that we can do that. But, you know, I didn't, I, I never did any advertisement. I never did any, any um, flyers or anything like that. It was just a word of mouth. People walk by. We even have our, our first sign was just a cardboard box that we put on top and it says Los Arroyos now is open. And, but everybody, you know, I studied that location very well. I went and looked around what what they need, how can we compete, how fast can we beat, you know, the average price that we have. And, and you know, I kind of did the numbers because I started a little accounting too. So I know a lot of percentage. And and so I work in that. And the, the format that we put was perfect. People, people likes it. It was quick. It was recent prices, great quality. And the whole world mouth is what make me make me be where I am right now. Hey, all right, uh, Ruben Perez from Black Sheep. Um, if I remember the story correctly, your family was actually from a different. You were restaurateurs in a different part of the state and uh, decided to come to Santa Barbara and, and, um, and try your hand here. So tell us a little bit about your background and, and how you chose Santa Barbara, and then how you ended up finding what was then Seagrass, which which Mitchell owned at the time. Yeah, yeah, Ted. So a lot of a lot of chance and luck for sure. Um, my background, been doing this for about 20 years, started as a dish pit, uh, no favoritism in the family. So definitely had to work all stations, cooking, cleaning, you know, bus boy, lunch server, dinner server. And uh, at a certain point, I ended up moving to Los Angeles and getting into the David Myers group, uh, which taught me a lot, which is really awesome. And uh, that's a short version of that story. Uh, but in uh, 2008 or so, um, I was in LA. Um, I think the food scene wasn't phenomenal back then, uh, but I, I miss my dad I, and I miss his food. And he had a restaurant up in, in Northern California uh, from 98 to 2010. And um, basically came up with this plan to move back home and try to convince him to look for greener pastures uh, after 9-11, his restaurant wasn't doing very well. And uh, I thought his food was too good not to get represented. So. Um, basically came with this little plan, went back home and convinced them to sell. And we were looking at many different places, Reno, you know, San Francisco, Sacramento, mainly California. And you, um, you're up in like, you're up in Grass Valley or something like Grass that? Grass Valley, or? Nevada city, kind of between yeah. Sacramento and Tahoe. <laughs> and, um, yeah, we came, um, um, just got a restaurant consultant, um, named Robert Perez, which is my dad's name. Uh, everything kind of let itself out, which was really cool. But we were looking at these different properties in Summerlin and Santa Barbara, uh, 1129 location, which is now the yoga place, which is way beyond our means. And um, Robert Perez ended up knowing somebody who knew somebody who might know somebody who possibly has a restaurant on the market. <laughs> and that was that guy up there. And uh, we ended up uh, being able to go look at the place and... Um, everything just kind of unfolded which was really cool um like everyone else are you know we are not find ourselves to be attracted to the main street areas so this off street was just perfect uh you know rent um feasibility everything just really perfect so um yeah we've been here for 10 years now 
Um, and you kept the you kept the seagrass concept at first, and then kind of evolved over time. Yeah, exactly. So uh, now, after having kids, time doesn't make sense to me anymore. So bear with me on my my time here. Uh, but yeah, we kept uh, seagrass for a handful of reasons. A fairly new restaurant, a lot of money in the marketing, and uh, just went with it. And it, it was great, but it wasn't our passion. And Mitchell remembers having conversations with with me. And, uh, you know, we wanted to bring kind of a fun, fun flair to it. Um, and thank God the Lark kind of came in and paved the way for us little guys to come in and be able to establish and start following that trend. And um, we, we ended up closing Seagrass and relaunching another restaurant. Uh, I started Black Sheep in uh, 2014 and it wasn't easy. Uh, I cried myself to sleep many nights as you can see, aged. <laughs> and uh, but but we stuck into it we really had a concept that um, I believed in and I thought there was a need for so it was great and it just started picking a momentum and going and going and before you know it we were ripping down walls and re refurbishing on uh, before graduation weekend and making a 12 top table out of nothing and it was great you know it's been a really interesting process uh, we did end up closing Seagrass and relaunching Oveja Blanca. Um, and it was just really confusing. The kitchen is pretty small. Uh, so trying to run two different concepts out of one, one kitchen uh, wasn't, wasn't feasible. So what we ended up doing is taking over the whole block. So for about a year or so, we ran the whole, well, the whole station as Black Sheep, which was, again, had its interesting moments, but keep trying to pivot and moving. And um, we ended up, but most recently, before COVID, about a year prior, uh, renting out to Lumen Winery, which is great people, owners of Pico, and they had a wine bar. It was like that winning recipe and everything just clicked and it was just phenomenal. And then COVID, you know. Uh, so yeah, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're happy to be here and uh, it's, it's, it's a blessing. Santa Barbara is awesome. Yeah, it's funny, the Ruben story, I had never thought of this before, but all three of us have in common the fact that our growth plan was to take over space next door. <laughs> For me, yeah. it was the private dining room, the corp room, which was a goth clothing store <laughs> when I opened it for Sean, you know, cobwebs and black clothing. And for Ruben, uh, it was the uh, antique store next door. Yeah. And uh, for Tony, it was the nail shop. And it's funny because I look at a lot of the restaurants around town and the one that sticks in my mind the most that should have been successful and couldn't have succeeded without that was uh, Julienne. And so many people have great fond memories of Justin West and his restaurant. And whenever I looked at his concept and I went, this is, this is a home run. The problem was eventually, you know, time catches up with your small little jewel blocks of a restaurant and you don't have sufficient resources to you know, grow and expand and survive all of these added on expenses uh, that have come over 10 years in a restaurant. And I think if he had had the ability to move next door and at a private dining room or something else, he would be on this call today. Yeah, and, and though Jesse couldn't do it, I mean, kind of the only reason you guys could do it was because you're on side streets, right? I mean, the State Street yeah. properties tend to be massive and that's one of the problems with State Street is they're just too big for Great Even point. Small, for small restaurants to bite off. So the site really kind of opens up that expansion uh, idea. Uh, Ruben, was, you, was your dad a uh, game for all of the changes over the years? I mean, is he, he's a pretty flexible, creative guy, or is he more classical? And he's like, what is my son doing? This is why I want to work with him. He, uh, he's, he's older and he's old school. I mean, uh, so old school, he was trained in Europe. You could still throw a frying pan at somebody and get away with it. And... Uh, <laughs> Not anymore. Uh, it's, it's crazy. But uh, what I love about him the most is he's always reading. He's always back there teaching, growing, learning. And I find uh, there's a, you know, chefs tend to get kind of stuck in their box. And I've always been really honored to work with him that he's able to keep progressing forward. It's pretty cool. All right. Um, while we're talking to you, Ruben, why don't we start talking about some of the stuff um, you guys did in, in, in COVID and the pandemic? Um, I mean, you guys were really quick to get creative. So kind of tell us, I mean, it feels like now we're in the, I don't know, which I guess we're the third wave of COVID, but for you guys, it seems like we're in, I don't know, I wouldn't even want to describe it because I can't imagine what you're going through, but Ruben, like give us some of the stuff that you did to kind of keep the doors open and, and um, survive during this, you know, unprecedentedly difficult time. Well, you know, again, I have two kids. So when this first happened, no, was not an option. 
<clears throat> and um, cl closing the doors didn't seem like something that was realistic. And um, just, you know, doing the research, uh, trying to figure out kind of what other people are doing, uh, different cities, different models. And uh, I ended up coming up with um, uh, family meals and uh, not the creator, many people are doing it, but it seemed, you know, with uh, like Mitchell touched on earlier, um, trying to figure out a way that we can keep the essence of black sheep, still try stay true to what we do, but coming to the realization that people weren't ready or wanting to spend 30, $35 for entrees and find a kind of a model of formula of food that's been able to travel well and package well. And so we, we came up with that family meal and it was a good fit for us. And also to, you know, for us, it was crazy because <clears throat> I've never done to go food before. Uh, it's not my passion. Uh, it's not what I'm in the business for, but, um, you know, just to, we had to do something really quick in order to start keeping cash flow going. Cause when the first happened, I don't know about the rest of you, but I was like, Oh, what the hell is going on? And how long is this going to happen? Like, let's go. Uh, luckily now I feel like we're all professionals and we can kind of take it easy a little bit, <laughs> but, um, yeah, we just, uh, try to get creative. Um, uh, you know, the family meals were really fun for us cause we were able to read like every week we had to a different theme so we didn't get the stagnant because being stagnant in this business is uh that can be the death death of you for sure right um and then during this latest shutdown you guys have actually shut down except for some holiday service it sounds like <clears throat> yeah we um i uh being in this business for 20 years haven't had a christmas off uh thanksgiving new year's and uh mainly because of timing that it happened again in december decided to enjoy my family get some rest, reevaluate the situation. Um, I, I, the last several months have definitely been uh, very tiring. So um, just kind of look for some perspective. So yeah, this time we just shut it down, uh, try to regroup and see what the next step is. Right. Uh, Mitchell, I mean, you, uh, as much as you try, people try to distance themselves from, from that fine dining now, um, you guys are kind of the epitome of fine. I mean, you're casual enough that anyone can come in there and have a good time, but you're essentially the epitome of fine dining in downtown Santa Barbara doesn't work that well as a to-go package. So what did you do um, in the beginning of the pandemic and, and how have you kind of uh, made things happen going on now almost a year? Right. Well, you know, the fine dining as a moniker, I think is, is gone. I mean, I, I think there are a few people that will hang on to that and do well. You know, if you're going to be the last one standing, uh, good for you. Um, but I think what comes along with that in our esteem is really just a dining experience. Um, you know, people come to dine with us because they enjoy the ambiance, they enjoy the meal, of course, the wine program needs to be sound, um, but ultimately it's to hang out and, and be in a space, not to get it in a clamshell container and take it home and have it be cold and, you know, all that sort of thing. So, um, however, when we first closed down in, in March uh, by decree, uh, we decided that when we did reopen, we would give that the old college try. And so we reinvested in a new um, uh, point of sale system that would allow us to integrate our online website to provide ordering takeout. Uh, and it, it was up and down. You know, there were days, even weeks where it was great and there were others where it was really quiet. Um, but ultimately, I think what most people don't really gather from our business model is that approximately two thirds of the staff at a front of house restaurant that does full service dining uh, is expendable in a takeout model. So when you say as a community at large or someone who's suggesting that takeout is a an opportunity to pivot, as we like to say. Uh, what you're really saying is we don't need bussers, we don't need servers, we don't need managers, we don't need hosts, we don't need food runners. And again, that's about two thirds of our staff. So even if we were willing to do that, that's not a pivot, that's a complete business model change. So if you were to write that plan in my class that I teach at the City College on restaurant ownership, I would say you heavily weighted towards your front of the house staff and your rent's way too high, and you're not doing enough revenue to support it, and you're gonna fail and go out of business in about three months. So if this really were the, the, the long-term plan, you'd eliminate your $12,000 rent 
month place, you'd find something, you know, off State Street again, side street for, you know, five grand, and you'd chop your 25 uh, employee staff down to about six, seven, eight, and you do whatever food you thought translated into takeout and everyday dining. Um, and that's, you know, Tony's got a, a perfect concept because there's never a day where you don't wake up and go, damn, a breakfast burrito sounds good. <laughs> I like <laughs> to so true. About a for lunch, but you know, it's the kind of food you eat every day. I don't think anybody wakes up in the morning and says, I'd love to have, you know, black sheep's uh, pork belly braised as my, you know, lunch array any more than they're thinking the trio of scallops from Bouchon would be a phenomenal lunch in a styrofoam container or any container for that matter. Uh, so after having reopened, ironically, you know, we were gangbusters uh, from June on between the takeout and being open for outdoor dining. We had our busiest six months uh, ever, wow. which is hilarious when you think we've been here for 22 years. And then it all comes to a screeching halt when we can't serve, you know, indoor nor outdoor. Uh, and so to try to continue on again with an $80,000 a month payroll serving, you know, five, 10 takeout orders a night is just impossible. Uh, so, you know, again, we've learned these things the hard way, uh, but for us as a dining experience, that's really where our, our focus remains. And so we're closed until we can reopen in a safe manner and continue to deliver, you know, the dining experience we're known for. Right. Um, Tony, I mean, Mitchell makes a nice segue into you, um, uh, you know, your, your style of Mexican food, casual, but more upscale than just a taqueria um, is a desired uh, food all the time, uh, especially in Santa Barbara. So how have you done and um, how are things going? I go to the Los Arroyos on Cayo Real quite a bit. Um, you guys have some of the best pozole, depending on who's making it uh, that day. Um, but um, how, how, how is your, uh, it's always one of the best. Sometimes it's the best, I would say. Sometimes uh, so, it's spicy, sometimes it's not, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> Um, so Tony, tell us about how Los Royals has, you know, pivoted and uh, what you guys have been uh, up to uh, during the pandemic. You know, I, something that I agree with Mitchell and Ruben is, and, and I connect with that, is that we come from the same background. You know, we started from fishing all the way to who we are now. And in this pandemic, it really makes us exercise our, our experience, which is this. And, and they make me connect with my employees more and they make me realize that, okay, we need to fix this up. And yes, I do have two different concepts. You know, I have full service also, like he says, I do have an $80,000 payroll um, as a Montecito. And so, and we also have the downtown location, which is different, but in the beginning, you know, I was hoping that the pandemic is gonna go away. And, and that's when you start pulling a little bit, you say this and say, yeah, it's okay. I'm gonna, you know, back it up a little bit. We'll be fine. This is gonna go away. When I see this was not going away, that's when I start focusing on all my employees. I went back and checked my payroll, check on my employees, you know, how many meals a day I was pulling up, even though I can do the two goals. And like he says, it's a, a food that it takes well to take home to go. And, but I redo the whole sketching for my employees and make sure that they all have at least something to come out, you know, something to go home. And, and at first I start with four days, with three days, and, and he's right. You know, I try not to let anyone go. Um, I start cutting hours and everybody, and I even start feeding my employees. You know, I said, take a meal, you know, do this. And because my cost is nothing and so it'll be it'll be nice for them to do that but to be honest it's, it is being a big change for us even even though I'm a, a casual restaurant a takeout restaurant the whole thing changed in my case I have employees uh, more than 60 that they've been working for me more than 10 years so they don't make the minimum you know, they make good money and there's no way I can cut up the payroll. So I, I cut the hours, but not their salary. And, and it was a, a big change. You know, the whole thing changed for me, the whole concept. And, and thanks God, we got all those uh, companies that they support us and deliver. And, and honestly, you know, the community of Santa Barbara really back us up as a local owners and, and people they know us, they know Mitchell, they know Ruben, they know ourselves and, and, Thanks to this community, we're still alive, to be honest. 
right? I remember we started having these restaurant chats oh, almost a year ago. Um, there was, everyone was saying, well, not everyone, but people were saying, we're probably not going to be back to normal until, the, t- until there's a vaccine, which all of us thought was going to be way in the future. Um, and now it seems like that's still the answer. And at least we're closer. Um, I mean, Mitchell, you were on some of those early conversations. Is that is that kind of your feeling right now that things are not going to get back to some semblance of normal until, you know, a, a good amount of us are, are given the, the shots? Yeah, I think that it's a really just, it's an important distinction between those who feel comfortable already and those who don't. You know, the biggest criticism right now in the restaurant world is that outdoor dining was never identified as a, as a spreader of the virus, uh, yet we were shut down. And I think that's a real issue for a lot of restaurants. Uh, whereas we know social gatherings, you know, no matter how much we believe the COVID contract, contact tracing is functioning or not, you know, even at 40% of being able to trace where they got it, uh, is determining that you know 70 plus percent of most people have gotten it in a social setting and a lot of us restaurants have argued you know prior to the, the state lockdown order that you know that's better than the one and a half or two percent of people that have been traced to getting it in an outdoor restaurant dining environment uh, but regardless of that uh, you know we feel that as long as people feel comfortable and safe going out and that they feel we're doing the right thing to be safe uh, that will be busy as soon as people get the green lights to go out again. Uh, so the difference really is when will the state determine, you know, we're safe to do that, that again. You know, it was interesting to hear that Sacramento has already had their region uh, lifted. Um, we feel we're probably about a month away, you know, give or take. Um, you know, mid-February would be ideal. Um, and as long as the vaccinations continue apace, I know we're all in tier one B one or whatever the numbers are, <laughs> uh, but restaurant uh, workers should be, you know, getting vaccinated within the next three to four weeks. Uh, that's a huge difference, I think, for people. And then it will get to the place where we felt, you know, maybe people should have been six months ago. Whereas they're thinking, Am, do I feel comfortable to go out? And if I do, great. And if I don't, then I won't. And I think the vaccinations will will help a great deal with that. And then it'll be up to the individual operator. You know, does Tony feel comfortable opening? Where's his staff at? You know, Ruben, does he feel comfortable opening? Do I feel comfortable opening? Um, you know, we'll all make those individual decisions based on, you know, what's going on that day. Right, right. Ruben, does that more or less describe your uh, opinion on this situation too? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you, you know, you have, people are gonna start feeling more confident. I mean, I, I mean, it's such an interesting thing because like Mitchell said, um, I also had the best end of the summer that I've ever had. So people want to come out and, um, but it, you know, we're just in an interesting time right now. So I, you know, keep pumping that vaccine out, let people start feeling more confident with that. I think it's definitely the way to go, you know, for, for restaurants to be safe is nothing new for us. We, this is something we abide by. We have products that can really hurt people. And, um, you know, for us, it's it's frustrating because we, we tend to have that responsibility just constantly, not just because of COVID. So, um, yeah, let's, you know, pump it up, get it out. Let's do it. Right. Matt, we do have a couple questions when you um, have want to just save a few moments for that. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to ask to all of you, whoever can jump in. Um, I mean, do you, do you feel like this has force you to, to become a stronger uh, business. I mean, obviously we would not have chosen the pandemic to uh, learn some lessons, but um, are there things you've learned from this that you think are gonna help you succeed even better into the future? Or was this just a big um, unnecessary fiasco? <laughs> it, uh, it awoke me. Oh, it's me. Um, <laughs> yeah, all of the above. And uh, you know, for me, uh, it's kind of nice. Again, 20 years in the business. Uh, I'm young, but I've been doing it. Um, it uh, you know, I think everyone in this business can reach a stagnant point. Uh, not always intentional, but sometimes it happens. And I know for me, prior to COVID, I, I think I was starting to get a little complacent. And so my silver lining is that this really kind of shook things up a little bit and reconfirmed that, you know, 
business owners and us, we're, we're strong people and it's great to kind of, you know, even if it's a modest, small thing, but to reinvent yourself. So it, it's been, uh, it's been tough and it's been crazy and I don't want to repeat it, but kind of grateful for just different connections with people and myself and, uh, you know, you got to look at that at least. So, right. Uh, any of you, uh, you guys have a, an opinion on that? Or should we get to some of our uh, uh, doctor questions? No, I, I, I agree with, with Ruben, to be honest, is the whole game change and it's not going to be easy for us to go back to normal right away. And it's up to the customers that they're going to see how can we really take care of them and make it secure and safety for them. Um, you know, we learn a lot. I me mean, as a restaurant owner, I really, really learned something that in 22 years I haven't done it. And and it's, you know, how to take care of my business, how to jump in and, and make sure that it, everything is correct for me and my employees and the customers. And it's kind of be tough to go back to normal, but I, I agree with uh, Mitchell. Once, once Santa Barbara knows that we're back in normal, we always have the support. And it's up to us just to make sure that it's safe to place for everybody to come. Great. Um, all right, let's go to some of these, these um, questions from, from the crowd here. Um, this is, uh, I don't know if it's a tough question, but it's, a, it's a, probably a stressful question for the person asking. Uh, what is your advice to a new restaurant opening in the time of COVID? Yeah, we do have some bold uh, entrepreneurs right now that have opened, have had to close and want to reopen again. So please speak to that. I'll go last. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go after Mitchell. <laughs> uh, well, Maria just joined us, I believe. Does, does she want to answer this question? No. Okay, <laughs> That's a hard one. That's a really hard one. I mean, Welcome, Maria. Be, no, uh, no. I mean, you know, for, for someone who's starting out, you know, unfortunately, people are closing. Uh, things are changing, but we need people to, to stay brave and to keep you know, we need people to open and, and the community needs to come back to life. And, you know, unfortunately, I don't know if it's unfortunate for a person who's starting it, but there's going to be opportunities to be able to lease spaces or take over existing restaurants. And, you know, we could, uh, we need, we need people to keep coming and, and, and moving forward and not to be scared right now. So uh, rent, 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 uh, 10%, you know, find it out. It's kind of my advice. I mean, there's a very strong potential that this will kind of spin into a, a bit of a opening market, right? I mean, rents might be a little lower when things start to, you might be looking at a year from now, but um, we could have a bit of a restaurant resurgence, um, you know, when these roaring 20s kick off, which is what I'm hoping happens uh, after all this. Um, which is phenomenal for the consumer, uh, but for the people who are currently in business and hanging out by a thread, you know, it's unfortunate that, you know, this creative destruction as we refer to it, uh, is created by the pandemic, not because someone's you know, business wasn't otherwise sound. Um, so the, the hardest part for me right now is making sure that my staff is taken care of. You know, Ruben mentioned it, Tony's mentioned it. You know, we've all come up from the, the dishwasher to the top and the, the way we got there was because we cared about people and this yes. business is people business. And so we all three, I can speak for them clearly 100% care mostly about our staff. And as long as that's covered and we can take care of them, then we're good with anything else. We'll, we'll pivot all day long. We'll, we'll do the gift card thing, even though it's a micro loan. You know, we'll talk about takeout, even though we must to lay off two thirds of our staff to make that happen. Not really, but you get my point. Um, but ultimately, I, I, I'm most saddened by the fact that, yes, there will be a lot of casualties, as Ruben mentioned. Uh, there's a ton of space available, and, and young, new, or old, new entrepreneurs will roll in and take advantage of that, that vacuum, and, and good for them. I don't hold any ill will towards them. I, I do feel um, a, a great deal of remorse that, that our society doesn't take care of those that, again, through no fault of their own, uh, have to lay off their staff bankrupt their business, you know, you know, not be able to send their kids to college or whatever their personal experience may be, uh, because we weren't in a position to take care of them, even though, again, it was no fault of their own. Uh, so 
you know, in six months, we won't have this conversation again because we'll be moved on. Um, but, but I'll take a moment to pause and, and think about all those compatriots of Tony's and Ruben's and mine uh, that got wiped out because of this and, and didn't have any way to carry on because there wasn't an opportunity to do so. Important and to share that. Yeah. You know, you me, Mitchell says something early that I agree with him and I know they agree with me too, is you really have to like this business. It's not just to go and invest money and, and, and let's try. And I can see this guy selling tacos and we do tacos too. And, you know, you really need to roll the restaurant business. And I love the restaurant business just like they do. And that's the reason we continue our life because he's right. It's going to be a lot of opportunities right now to open a business. It's going to be a lot of lower rent and, and employees that they're looking for a new job. But if you, if you really don't care about the business, it, it, my opinion is it's really hard. You're going to make it, to be honest. To be honest. So you really have to like the restaurant business. Yeah. And, and I would shoot back to that questioner, what type of restaurant are they thinking of opening? You know, it's a very broad definition. Are you thinking of a full service sit down restaurant? Or you think of a, a quick pickup? Are you doing a pop up in industrial ale? You know, what, what type of business that has a lot to do with whether or not you're going to make it through this. True. Um, the same the same um, questioner has a, has a more specific one. And I don't know if this is too um, specific to ask you guys, but um, do any of you do a percentage rent? What's your opinion of doing a low base rent with a percentage rent? I guess compared to, um, you know, the full, just a full kind of more normal rent scheme. <clears throat> then you guys pay your percentage in, in rent. Um, no. Or do you not want to answer I, that? I don't. I, I'm familiar with that concept. I know there are a lot of people out there that do. Uh, a lot of the uh, waterfront restaurants are in that position, you know, where they pay a percentage of rent. Um, it can be great in downtimes, especially, you know, especially if you don't have a minimum guaranteed amount or it's strictly a, a portion of your, your gross receipts. So if you're closed completely, like Ruben and I are right now, the rent would be zero. That would be great. Uh, but typically, there's going to be a minimum guaranteed amount associated with that lease. And then when you do really well, you're going to feel really badly that you're busting your butt, as Tony nods his head, uh, right. and give a lot more to your landlord instead of reaping the benefits of your success. Yeah, you almost Not bet against yourself a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are a couple of questions that I think almost I can answer because we've kind of gone over them over the, over the last year. But um, one is, um, is anyone having trouble with the health department when they keep reopening and closing with the COVID restrictions on and off? I mean, I can think I can answer for you guys and say that, yes, that's been pretty annoying. I mean, is there a better way to uh, describe that? Well, my, my problem is not with the health department. I've reached out to all of our city officials and our county officials for the last, you know, almost year now, and I've had nothing but fantastic reports and response and input from them. Ultimately though, what most people fail to understand right now is that this is a state level decision and no one in the city of Santa Barbara County is willing to countermand anything Governor Newsom says or the state of California says. So there's nothing that can be done until we exit this state. Well, and, and Solvang tried that, but they kind of got um, a little bit locked out yeah. of town to some extent. Yeah. Um, and then another question, this kind of relates to our side street uh, theme um, is, you know, with all of the um, stuff that was happening on State Street, did you guys feel left out um, for a little while? I know it took a little bit longer to get um, some permits to do your out your parklets, um, but how has the city kind of come around and, and helped you guys do those when you could do those? Tony, do you want to tell us your experience? There? Well, for, me, for me, it was really hard. Uh, you know, the State Street actually kills my business in the beginning and yes the city the city had to give you you know just an idea what they want outside in the patio how can we do it um, they actually were very pleased to help us but but it really the the state street which is beautiful I love it and and everything but a, a size restaurant like mine it really kills my business a little bit and and um, going back with the, the health department thing I got nothing bad to say. They've been very supportive to all the businesses. You know, every time I need a question of employees or things that we need to be done, they right away respond. So nothing bad to say about the health department. I can't thank them enough. 
Ruben, did you have um, trouble opening uh, your parklet um, initially? I, I actually don't have a parklet. I uh, had this vision forever to turn my parking space, my beautiful parking space, into, uh, <laughs> into a patio. And so I decided rather than doing the street, uh, I was able just to uh, put a little awning over it and uh, make, make that into a nice little cozy. I don't trust people coming out of the parking lot. They... Uh, on a Saturday night, I, I just keep imagining plowing right into my guest, enjoying some fox in and some fog raw. I know it's not okay. Right, okay. right. And Mitchell, I know um, your guys' street had to lobby to get to get that closed down, but it ended up working out for you, right? Yeah. In fact, uh, we would not have done a parklet on Victoria Street without the street being closed. Uh, I found it interesting to read today in the Independent. I don't know if it was today. Uh, published, but I read it today, that part of Janine's reason for closing was just the, the traffic on uh, West Figueroa there, or East Figueroa for them. You know, the bus was rumbling by, and our fear was that it just wouldn't seem uh, safe, let alone a comfortable in uh, environment for dining out for an hour and a half. Uh, so we were very fortunate to have benefited from Scarlet Begonia moving from the interior Victoria Courtyard out to uh, West Victoria Street to the space that most people will remember as Blue Sharp Bistro or Epiphany or Arlington Tavern, or most recently uh, the Nugget. But having that space in the back courtyard was was great for us. But once we were able to get the street closed, uh, then we're very you know, happy to have that space directly in front of the restaurant. A lot easier to serve and a, and a lot better long term. We're hoping to be able to keep that. Right. You forgot your neighbor Locavore, which was there for about three weeks. Yeah. No. <laughs> We had more time. I could list more. You want Soho? The original Soho? Soho? Started there. That's right. All right. I think we've covered all of the questions from um, those watching. You've answered all my questions. Robin, do you have anything else for them? Um, no, I think we've covered all the questions. I just want to talk a little bit about next week's show. Um, is that okay to go into now? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys all for participating. Great. Of thanks, Matt. Thank you so much. This has been a really wonderful, robust conversation. And thanks so much for all your contributing. We hope you can get open as soon as possible. Absolutely. Um, so next week's show, we will be speaking about heads and beds. So we're um, talking with Chris Klein from the Canary Hotel, Warren uh, Nocon from uh, Hotel California, and then uh, Paul uh, Bullock from uh, the Eagle Inn. So please join us again uh, next week at three o'clock for our next downtown spotlight. Thanks, Matt, for being um, my co-host. Thanks for um, all you're doing, Mitchell, um, Tony, Maria, and Ruben again. Um, and then please do come out today to our State Street Promenade Market. It started at three, goes till 7.30 on the thousand block of State Street. You can shop local retailers, um, local artisans, and um, we have a lot of supporting local to do to keep our downtown community through, um, you know, get us through this pandemic. So hope to see you out there. Check out our website at downtownsb.org for more information and a whole directory of downtown businesses you can support. We'll see you guys next time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, right. Thanks, everybody. Bye.